This is Sheriff Fortney to all Sheriff's Office personnel. I'm personally reaching out to all of you to say how thankful I am that each of you are at work today. You're doing a difficult job in a difficult time. You've shown up to work while facing the pandemic, widespread civil unrest, a significantly growing population, and an increased danger and stress associated with all of it. It's sometimes hard for people who don't experience with their own boots on the ground to know what you see, what you face, and who you help every single day. They may not realize the places you go, the danger you run towards, and the people you meet on what is often the worst day of your life. We're gonna need more units out here. We're all coming. one of the scariest radio transmissions I've heard of my career. I heard my partner get on the radio and I knew something sounded off with his voice. And next thing I know, it's clear that they're in some type of altercation with someone. And it was so far away and it was such a rural and remote area of the county. And um, ultimately it really drove home that there are areas that we patrol where it's either just you or your partner. You have to really be able to keep that in mind and be as safe as you can be. Someone broke into my house. I think they might still be in there. We'll be there as soon as we can. Police, you're under arrest! Stop or I'll send the dog! There's! Coming you! Come on, answer. Just imagine if that was your home and you were waiting for us to respond. It could be a homeowner that's never called 911 before. And they're experiencing crisis for the first time, so they do call 911. And they're, they're in, in some sort of angst mode. They're, they're, they're anxious, they're, they're excited. They need our help. A slow day for a South County deputy is between 18 and 20 calls. Um, it's not uncommon for deputies out here to be handling you know, between 20, 25 to 30 calls per shift, per 12 hour shift. And so if we do the math, I mean, you've got six deputies handling, let's just say 20 calls. I mean, that's 120 calls per day. But we have to prioritize that. Now, now a more priority type call comes out, we're gonna, we're gonna divert our resources to that because we have to. And then they call back and they call back and they're still waiting. And if you if you could imagine that was the first time you ever needed law enforcement to come to your home and you had to wait sometimes hours for us to show up. It's not because we don't want to be there. It's because we just can't. What if you're driving back from the jail after booking somebody, you're going to that burglary that's been holding for an hour and another in progress call comes out that's a priority call like a stabbing or a shooting, a drive by shooting, a vehicle that's being stolen by force, a carjacking. You now divert to that other call. You don't go to that burglary because you have to prioritize those calls that could involve the life of someone. I've been struggling with a addiction for like 19, almost 20 years. It kind of all went really bad when my mom died in 2012. And I struggled going to jail, like constantly just not having any hope it seemed at the time. I was approached by Heather Banks. She would come out to the various camps that I stayed at. She she cornered me like a few times. She never gave up. She uh, saw me like two or three more times out there, always telling me like, there's a better life. And most of the time I would just kind of shrug it off. But, and without them actually being persistent and going out there and never judging me and they believed in me even even when I didn't believe in myself. And without that, I probably wouldn't be standing here today. And I owe them my life. I mean, I know I put in the work, but I'm here because of them. They care. And the Office of Neighborhoods, they gave me a chance. And, and I'm here. I'm alive, not in prison. I have my dad. I have a twin brother, niece and nephew. and. My dad tells me like all the time how proud he is of me. I mean, my brother don't talk like that. He's like my best friend. 
I remember one time he saw me out there. I didn't see him very much when I was out there. And the first thing he did was give me a hug. You know, and, and that, and he told me once that he he was expecting like someone to a cop to say that I was dead, and to hear him say that was I don't I don't like it. And having my family back, it's I can't even describe it with words. You know? The opioid epidemic changed things dramatically in the sense of they would come in, uh, they would start to withdraw, and you don't necessarily die from the withdrawal symptoms of opioids, uh, but the tertiary issues such as the dehydration, if they come in and they have you know other health issues and they're vulnerable, uh, maybe they're underweight, um, when they go through that process, it, it, it's life-threatening. We've consistently had about 30% of bookings come in that had an opioid uh, addiction issue. In my conversations with jail leaders across the country and going to different conferences, it became readily apparent that this was a nationwide problem. This wasn't something that was unique to Snohomish County, and there wasn't necessarily a magic solution out there. Jail is not a popular way to look at solving uh, community and society problems, especially when it comes to addiction. But the reality is, is with the lack of resources out in the community a lot of the times, or just unwillingness by those, uh, sometimes they have to hit bottom. And when they are sitting in a jail cell and they think about all the things that they've lost and they have nothing but time, sometimes this could be the helping hand to get them through. Good morning, thank you everybody for being here. It's a big day, it's a special day. Um, I wanna start by uh, telling you yesterday we arrested a 62 year old lawful man for the 1993 murder of 15 year old Melissa Lee. How does it feel to get another one like this? Well, if you can imagine, you know, being Melissa's mom or her sister, um, they've been waiting for 27 years for this to be solved and for the person or persons to be held responsible for, you know, who, who killed their daughter. There will never, they'll, they'll never get over it. I mean, that's, there's never gonna be complete closure. You can't bring Melissa back. You can't bring these victims back, but you can provide some justice. I mean, I could sit in my office and work seven days a week, 12 hours a day, and just scratch the surface off of what we need to get done. I mean, how, how, how does that work, you know? And, I, and like I mentioned earlier, our cold cases that we have, I don't wanna be the one that has to tell a family member that, sorry, we can't work on your case because we don't have time or money. I mean, that's, that's not fair. If I had a loved one that was murdered or assaulted, you know, I'd want that to be worked on and to have somebody try to solve that case to find the person or persons that were responsible. When I started in Major Crimes in 2007, we had three additional bodies. Since then, we've lost those three bodies. So we're working with less now than we did in 2007. That was 13 years ago. Part of the call-out process is it really is critical for us to get there as soon as possible. Um, best evidence is obviously things that are not exposed to the elements, uh, people flee, witnesses go back to their life, we may or may not ever be able to contact them. We are on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, we're not paid to be on call. Uh, we choose to be in our agency and the five of us choose to, to basically devote our lives to being on call for the citizens of Snohomish County. First of all, our overall mission is public safety. So we really are the safety net for the county when the public is in trouble. 
All of our aircraft are military surplus. Snawk 1 is uh, 1967, and our Bell UH-1 that we're currently flying is uh, 1970. There's a variety of uh, different missions that we participate in, everything from flooding incidences, Oso mudslides, looking for lost hikers, uh, hunters, climbers, skiers, uh, missing children. There is not much room, but uh, get me down there and we'll see how this looks. Copy that. How do you make a phone call and tell somebody, I can't investigate the rape of your 10-year-old today because we don't have resources? It's, it's more overwhelming the case pressures we have than it is a lot of the other things. And that's why detectives leave. They can't, they can't take that pressure. We're already at the point where we're having to make decisions on what cases are priorities, and some are falling back two and three years, and we're not, we're not getting to them already. Our operations scaled down as far as our discretionary budgets. You know, I understand that when we talk about budgets in law enforcement and corrections, they've got to be a discretionary budget. There's got to be a cool equipment fund, uh, a uniform fund, or, or things like that, or training. We simply don't have that. Those are line items that have never recovered since 2008, 2009. If we weren't able to respond to a call, if I didn't have this position, it'd be a huge loss in resources and tools for uh, the rest of patrol to utilize. Um, when I respond to a call, I'm able to bring specialty equipment, equipment that allows better and more effective communication with the subject. We lose manpower, we lose the ability to effectively control an environment, and ultimately the more people that we have, the more the better equipment, the better training, the better we're going to be able to affect a peaceful and positive outcome to a situation. Um, without the crisis negotiation team, without the SWAT team, um, we're really taking away a valuable tool and resource, not only for law enforcement, but to help the community at large. To be honest with you, I don't know how we would be able to do this with less people than we already have. If there were fewer sheriffs, we wouldn't be able to get the help that we needed on time. We don't need a less deputies, we need more. They need more support and more, more uh, sheriff's officers. It's unacceptable for me as somebody that lives in unincorporated county and feels safe about the deputies that come to my house. Um, but it's also concerning uh, the time and delay that it could cost them, it could cost my family. Um, I don't want to be the one that I can't to tell a family that I can't work on your case because we don't have the funding or we don't have the money to do that. Since 1861, sheriffs and deputies have served our community with pride and dedication. Every year we respond to more than 250,000 calls for service in our county and we continue to keep our community safe through partnerships, responding to emergencies, investigating crimes, and proactive policing. Each day we strive to show our core values in our work, integrity, dignity, commitment, and pride. We need you, the people we serve, to help us protect the staffing and services we currently have at the Sheriff's Office. Our population continues to grow each year and we cannot pass this important public safety funding issue on to the next generation.